Trimut's fleet has many buses which are 18 years or older. Uh, Trimut's average fleet age is 12 years, while well, the national average is considerably less. Yes. How soon can Trimut's fleet be modernized and what funding is available to, to accomplish this? Well, we absolutely have to begin to replace buses, and uh, you'll see that as a priority in the next budget that I'll release to the board next month. Um, we believe that in uh, the next fiscal year we'll be uh, budgeting for about 50, 51 uh, new 40-foot buses. Um, and then for every year thereafter, our projections and our budget um, forecast show about 40 buses a year. What that will do is gradually bring the average age down to what we think is a reasonable level. Um, we think buses should run pretty reasonably um, up to about a 15 year mark, getting them to 17, 18, even 20 years as some of our current fleet is way too old. So hope is on the way. We will um, use um, a series of grant funds in the next year that we've been able to piece together for those uh, 51. After that, that 40 per year will be um, uh, debt-based um, uh, funded. Uh, and that's our financial plan and included in our financial plan and forecast for the future. Uh, so what's the future of fr the free rail zone? The Portland streetcar is considering decoupling from the free rail zone so that its fares will be equitable throughout the loop when uh, that project opens? Well, we're certainly in the midst of a, of, of a very beginning of a process where we want to have a conversation with Portland Streetcar and with the city of Portland, with all of the users of the system about that. Uh, we started that by um, actually hiring an independent third party to collect a lot of data uh, about who uses the system and how they pay for it now and so that we have a good database to start from. Right now, we don't see any burning need to change free rail zone but there may be some um, issues of sort of consistency, if you will, with the streetcar that we want to consider. Um, so those, are, I think, are conversations for the future. I think uh, we'd be very open to any comments and considerations people have on that. To follow that up, how seriously is TriMet looking at revamping the current fare system? The zone system creates a lot of problems with regards to uh, consistency and equity. Is an electronic and or distance-based fare system a realistic option in the near future? Uh, I think it's a realistic option and it's one that I, uh, I would love to see us move to. I've never been a particular fan of the fare, of the fare zone system that we've got right now. Yeah, I'll just to give you examples of some of the crosstown service that runs for very long distances that's all in one zone. Um, and the fare zone system really worked for a radial system, and our system has migrated well beyond that, so it serves uh, multiple uh, of destinations, north, south, east, and west. One of the things we are really looking at is um, the technology and whether or not um, we need to think about smart card technology in the future or whether we need to think about um, other RFIC-style uh, technologies that are uh, being uh, now piloted um, uh, in, in some of the larger properties like New York MTA and, and some places in Asia. Um, so I, there, there is, I think, some hope that we'll have a, a really exciting uh, technology that will allow us to do really sensitive distance-based fares uh, in the future. Um, I would say that that's not a short-term option. I would say that's a mid to longer-term option that we're looking at. Um, part of Part of the issue is that it, there's a big cost associated with uh, implementing one of those systems. Um, I think the estimate that I've seen is around $20, 25000000 million for trying that. So we're not in a position that we can fund that now. I actually th would think that even if we had the money, it wouldn't be the time to do it right now because we need to see technology advance just a little bit more so that we can do those distance-based fares in what is frankly a little more challenging environment because we have these, this open system. Um, that doesn't have turnstiles, um, and so we need to make sure the technology is available and working for that kind of a system. Recently, a think tank posted a database of TriMet salaries to the web. A small but significant number of bus drivers put in a lot of overtime and earned over $100,000. At what point does it make sense to hire more full-time drivers than to be paying so much in overtime? Well, there is a, there is a break-even point, um, and I would say that um, when you get to the point of um, the, the hundred thousand dollar category, we probably um, that that is probably f first of all not best practice in my view. Um, it's a it's a practice that's really controlled by a current union contract where 
entering some conversations with the ATU leadership about that. Um, and it's because it's now assigned seniority based, so if a high seniority person wants to um, work that much, it's their choice right now to do that. And uh, I think there should, needs to be some, some tamping down of that. That said, the good news is that we're uh, hiring our first and beginning to train our first uh, crew class of new operators um, in really quite some time. So we are hiring new operators. Largely that's to take place um, for, for two reasons. One is the safety initiative where we're actually taking more operators out of the seat um, for in-classroom training time and behind-the-wheel training time. Uh, so as we begin the recertification pro program, we needed more operators, so we're doing that. The other uh, uh, thing is that we're actually, of course, uh, retirements and, and, um, and other um, attrition is occurring, so we're beginning to uh, replace that. So new drivers are coming. Hopefully we'll be in a position that we, can, um, we will not need as much overtime. So what are TriMet's plans regarding bringing on more fare, fare inspectors and why does TriMet only hire fare inspectors who are already bus drivers? Does this need to be a supervisory role? Well, I, I agree that we need more fare inspection on the system and that, we, um, and, and that we would benefit by that. I do think it needs to be a supervisory position um, because in addition to inspecting for fares, um, these positions also enforce the TriMet code overall. And so it requires, I think, a really strong level of knowledge about the overall operation. There's also sort of the advantage of having a flexible resource out in the field that can really address a number of problems at a time. So while they may be on a fair inspection mission, there could be another issue that could come up that requires um, knowledge and expertise, and having those people in the field is very, very valuable. Um, one of the things I hear from our operators is that they really want to feel supported and one of the ways we support them is of course with the supervisory staff out in the field uh, addressing problems as they occur. So I think for all those reasons it makes much more sense to keep them at a uh, supervisory level um, and, um, and again I hope that we can begin to expand those numbers over the next year. Why is rail considered to be such a good long-term investment? Uh, why are we expanding rail at a time when there have been so many cuts to existing service? Well, I think, uh, let me talk about specifically about the next rail investment, which is the Portland and Milwaukee project. And um, I can talk about it in a number of different ways. But first of all, I think it's a long-term investment for the transit system that, that provides that regional spine for regional development and growth. And that has been fundamental to the regional transportation plan really for decades here in Portland. And uh, so building out that system continues to be important. Uh, number two, right now, um, I, we have the opportunity to um, leverage in $750 million of discretionary federal dollars. So that's really base economic uh, improvement to the region. Uh, the project is projected to bring during the construction period 14,000 jobs and as I've often said that these, these are jobs to this region when we need, need them the most. Uh, finally from a transportation perspective, um, it really does move the system to more efficiency. Uh, TriMet as an agency will be contributing something on the order of 5% of the capital cost of the overall project overall. Um, but when we look at what it does for our operation, uh, the, the light rail operation will actually carry passengers, um, given that 5% investment and our additional operating costs for it, at, um, less the, or at about $1.50 per passenger. So it's a very cost-effective way to carry people. So what this is doing is moving our system to more efficiency over the long run. Uh, I think our average cost per ride for light rail is on the order of $1.80. Uh, many of our lines are $1.50 or less. Uh, Milwaukee's in that category, by the way, because it's a very efficient line. It throws um, a you know, relatively fast uh, run from Portland State University down to uh, Park Avenue, carries a lot of people, so the, the average cost per ride is really quite low. So I think um, the other thing that it clearly does is provide um, 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 uh, uh, development opportunities and one of the great really exciting things about the Portland Milwaukee project is that at the same time that we're developing the light rail line um, Oregon uh, the the Oregon University system is developing a new major uh, facility down uh, right at the station right at the corner of, of Moody and and the alignment of Porter Street 
And uh, again, the kind of economic development and growth uh, we see around that is really important to the region. And I think, again, it's another major, um, uh, major reason to, to, um, to see light rail uh, continue to be part of the plan. So as we look ahead to other corridors, um, could bus rapid transit be part of the solution? Absolutely. Could rapid streetcar be part of the solution? Absolutely. Uh, as well as you know, potential consideration of light rail. So I think, again, um, what, we've, what we've seen here in Portland is that, the other part of it is that we, we have developed a system that is attractive um, to choice riders. Now, 81% of our riders are choice riders. That means that they have a car at home, they have another, another way to get to their destination. And by having such a broad base of ridership, including choice riders, I think we grow support overall for public transit, and I think that's good for everybody. So could you speak a little further about the Milwaukee Light Rail and the uh, gap for uh, bonding future operational revenue? Uh, let me talk a little bit about the finance plan in general. It's about a $1.49 billion project. The federal government um, would contribute 50% of that, that, or about $750 million. The rest of those funds are coming from one local source or another, and the local sources include the state, um, ODOT, City of Portland, Clackamas County, City of Milwaukee, and TriMet. Um, all in all, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the TriMet share of that overall project is about 5%. And for that, we get some really great uh, ridership benefits. We get a growth in ridership. Uh, we have very effective service. We have, um, um, uh, you know, great development opportunities. What I think is really important is that the only part of that financial plan that is at all fungible, if to use that word, related to the overall um, TriMet budget and could be available for, for um, bus-related uses would be that 5%. So it's a relatively small number and the additional operating costs associated with it, uh, which is also a relatively small number. Um, so um, that, if you add that both our debt service and our operating costs together, it would require about oh, nine, nine and a half million dollars addition, addition to the TriMet budget in uh, fiscal year 15. 15 or 16, and we think that that's a very small price to pay for the additional 20,000 some riders that we're going to see um, on that line. The rest of that, 95% is discretionary money being drawn to the region, being drawn to our public transit system because of the light rail project. So we're seeing a great investment uh, in the region, a great uh, investment in our overall transportation system. Uh, at very little cost uh, and very little trade-off in terms of uh, uh, additional operating costs. The final point, which is actually many people don't realize, but uh, again, when we uh, sought authorization from the Oregon legislature to increase the rate of the payroll tax, that increased revenue was for new service. And all of the costs of Milwaukee Light Rail, including operations and capital, are coming out of that rate increase. So it's coming out of what was to be dedicated for new service. And essentially, every major light rail expansion we've had have brought new revenues to the table um, in the region for, for public transit. And because of those projects, we've seen resources for public transit grow over time. So A, we've grown resources. B, uh, we're operating more efficiently and uh, carrying more passengers at a lower cost. So those working together, I think, have helped actually um, improve bus service over time if, in terms of the resources that would be available for bus service. Um, I think we have to be careful not to, uh, if you will, confuse the effects of this last recession with sort of the long-term trend. After all, we are uh, according to U.S. News and World Report, the number one city for public transit in the U.S. Um, Sunset Magazine recently told us we're the best city in the West to ditch a car. We got there for a reason, and by, by making these smart investments um, over time, we've been able to build uh, a, a strong transit system, and, and that's what I hope to do in the years ahead as well.